Welcome to the Taste Test channel and this week we'll be taking an impartial look at affordable white wines from around the world to discover what the differences are and how the same wine from different countries varies in taste. A lot of us when selecting a relatively cheap bottle of wine will no doubt pick a variety we know we like, a Chablis or a Chardonnay for example, but I wonder how many of us choose a wine based on where it comes from. And yet we know that climate, rainfall, sunshine and soil all have a huge bearing on the taste of any fruit or vegetable we grow, so it stands to reason that the same grape will taste very different depending on where it's grown. So this week, in a bid to discover just how different a wine from Australia tastes to a wine from California, for example, we've picked six varieties of Sauvignon Blanc, also known as Fumé Blanc, all costing less than or around $10 or £8, and we'll be testing what the differences are and just how much or little they vary in taste based on which country they're grown and produced in. So our wines in this lineup are from France, the USA, South Africa, Australia, Chile and New Zealand. As always, just for fun, we'll be awarding our Taste Us Channel Best in Class Award to the winner. If you're new to the channel, just hit the subscribe button to ensure you don't miss out on any of our regular taste tests. So a quick insight into Sauvignon Blanc itself. It's one of the most widely grown grape varieties in the world and it's become a very popular white wine alternative to Chardonnay, having experienced a surge in popularity since the 80s, shortly after New Zealand started producing it en masse. The Sauvignon Blanc grape itself originates from the Bordeaux and Loire Valley regions of France and it's now grown extensively across the world. The wine is usually consumed when it's young, hence its fresh, crisp quality. Apparently extensive ageing can bring out a more vegetable aroma of peas or asparagus, but it also suffers from a duller flavour when the climate's too hot, so you can see how the differing weather of each country can dramatically affect the taste. It's recommended with fish dishes and cheese, and incidentally the first Friday in May is International Sauvignon Blanc Day. So our lineup of affordable Sauvignon Blancs from around the world this week is as follows. From the Loire Valley in France, we have Calvé Touraine. From California in the USA, Barefoot. From the Western Cape in South Africa, Porcupine Ridge. From South Australia, McGuigan Reserve. From Chile, Cassiero da Diablo. And finally, from the Marlborough region in New Zealand, Coolwater Bay. Now obviously the taste of each wine is going to vary based on all sorts of factors, right down to the processes of the specific vineyard and manufacturer, and we could probably talk all day about mineral and chalk influences on the soil and pH levels etc, but we're really not talking expensive bottles of wine here. So we're going to concentrate on the very basics and what the main differences are in taste, appearance and aroma between a Sauvignon Blanc from one part of the world to another, and to help us decide next time we pick up a bottle of wine how to make a more informed choice. As I mentioned, these are all affordable bottles of wine, around £8 or $10, and you can see the price that I paid on each bottle is fairly similar. By the way, the alcohol content of each is also around the same. It's between 12.5% and 13% volume. Nutritional-wise, our normal fat, sugar, salt and energy content analysis is obviously not going to be applicable to wine, but for those who are interested, the average medium glass of Sauvignon Blanc will contain 141 calories, or 590 kilojoules, so it does all add up. Okay, so let's see if there's any distinctive differences in their look and colour. So as you can see, they all look surprisingly similar, uh, but with the wines from California, Australia and Chile looking very slightly paler than the others, but overall very little detectable difference in colour. So we're going to start our taste test with this first wine from the Loire Valley in France, and we'll use this one as a bit of a comparison control, simply because, as I mentioned earlier, this is where the Sauvignon Blanc grape originates from. So this is Calvé Touraine. Calvé being the brand, which dates back to the 19th century, and Touraine being the appellation, which is one of over 60 districts governed within the Loire Valley. The Loire Valley itself, as you may be aware, has a long history of winemaking, and it's got a continental climate, which when coupled with the cool influences of the Loire River and the Atlantic Ocean nearby, actually helps slow down the ripening of the vine. Apparently that allows more time for the grape to develop a balance between its acidity and sugar levels. So let's see how it tastes.
Okay, so the aroma I'm getting is green apple, maybe with a slight hint of cider. The taste is very fresh and clean. There's no bitterness or vinegar and it's not overly dry or sweet. It seems to be full of subtle flavours. There's hints of lime and also of minerals, but no one specific flavour jumps out. It's very well rounded. The finish is very smooth and slightly creamy. In summary, I'd say really well balanced, very refreshing, thoroughly drinkable wine. Uh, that's very nice indeed. Next up from the USA, we have Barefoot Sauvignon Blanc from California. So the first cuttings of the Sauvignon Blanc grape were actually brought to California in 1880, but it wasn't really popular in reputation until the late 1960s when a Napa Valley uh, winery released it under the name Fumé Blanc. And it's actually still known in the US by that alias today. Barefoot brand themselves started in a garage in California in 1965 and have gone on uh, to claim to be the most awarded wine brand in the world. So it would be really interesting to see how this Californian Sauvignon Blanc compares. Okay, so the aroma is much more subtle than the French wine. There's not as much going on, but there are hints of floral notes and pollen. The taste is totally different from the last wine. There's a much harsher initial taste with more of an alcohol hit, but it's coupled with a fruit flavour, sort of slightly overripe melon coming through. The aftertaste lasts much longer than the French, but it's a little bit bitter, and much drier with sort of strong tannins, which leave your mouth with that slightly stripped feeling, a bit like when you've been eating rhubarb or walnuts. In summary, I'd say it's completely drinkable, definitely not at all unpleasant, but compared to the last wine, much drier and harsher. Next up, from South Africa, we have Porcupine Ridge Sauvignon Blanc. So Porcupine Ridge is made by Buchenhaus Kloof Winery in Franschik, in the coastal region of the Western Cape of South Africa. Uh, the small valley of Franschik has actually long been home to many famous wine estates, and its continental climate, along with the shadows of the surrounding mountains, help to moderate temperatures. The name of the wine is actually taken from the shy nocturnal porcupines that come out at night in the forest around the winery. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they're not used for crushing the grapes. Okay, so the aroma has got immediate notes of peas and sort of green vegetables. The taste is very different, again, from both of the others. It's drier than the French, but not as dry as the Californian. Um, and it's got green vegetable flavours coming through, sort of fresh pea, grasses and asparagus. The finish is relatively smooth. It's not too acidic or tannic. In summary, I would say not at all unpleasant. It's a nice smooth finish and refreshing, but definitely with a more earthy green vegetable palette. Next up, from South Australia, we have McGuigan Reserve Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so with a family background in the business, McGuigan Wines was formed in the 1990s and have gone on to be one of the most awarded wineries in the world, winning the title of International Winemaker of the Year on four separate occasions. Australia, however, hasn't traditionally been big on producing Sauvignon Blanc, but more recently, varieties from grapes grown in the Adelaide Hills have been well received, and that's where this one is from. So it'll be really interesting to see how this one compares. Okay, so the aroma is fresh, um, but it's very subtle. There's not much coming through. There's possibly a sweet, almost candy floss smell, but it's barely there. Um, the taste is slightly sharp, but the flavours are also very subtle. Um, there's not a whole lot going on in there. There's a hint of minerals, possibly chalk, and it's neither overly dry or overly sweet. The finish is smooth and, and quite pleasant. I would say in summary, it's non-offensive, but it's not as complex flavours as some of the others. Possibly a little bit dull and flat, but again, not unpleasant. Next up, we have Cassiero del Diablo Sauvignon Blanc from Chile, made by Concha y Toro Winery. So this wine is made using grapes from three different coastal regions of Chile. And again, the cooler climate of the coast means that the grapes ripen later, allowing their intense flavours to develop. Incidentally, the story behind the name of this wine actually comes from over 120 years ago when the founder of Concha e Toro stored batches of his very best wines in an underground cellar. Apparently, he noticed that the bottles had started being stolen, so he decided to spread a rumour among the locals that a devil lived in his cellar, hence the name of Casiero del Diablo, which means the devil's cellar. Diablo wines are now the most widely recognised Chilean wine brand and have received multiple international awards in recent years, so it'll be really interesting to see how this compares.
Okay, so the aroma, I am straight away getting an overwhelming smell of fresh peas. And the taste is also the same. It's strongly vegetal. There's peas and green veg coming through. It's not unpleasant and it's smooth and full bodied, but that's definitely the dominant flavor. There's a harsher finish, edging on dry, but not as dry as the Californian. I would say um, in summary, it's not unpleasant, it's full bodied and a drier finish than many of the others, but definitely more green vegetable than I would ordinarily prefer. Last but by no means least, we have Cool Water Bay Sauvignon Blanc from the Marlborough region of New Zealand, and that's made by Yalen's Estate Wines. Uh, Yalen's Estate Wines uh, sits in the Awatere Valley, which is close to the coast in Marlborough. They started in 2008, are vegan friendly and certified carbon neutral. Um, as I mentioned earlier, New Zealand, and in particular the Marlborough region, has actually become highly respected for its Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, apparently the cool sunny climate of New Zealand's islands means that no winery is ever particularly far from the coast so you get that longer growing season for the grapes to develop a ba balance of acids and sugars. If you couple that with the perfect drainage of sandy soils and slate shingles of the Marlborough region apparently it results in lower yields but with better flavours. So considering New Zealand are responsible for the surge in popularity of Sauvignon Blanc uh, since the 80s I'm really curious to see how this one compares. Wow, so that aroma is very different to the others. It's got a sweet floral aroma, almost like an elderflower cordial. The taste is much less sweet though than it smells. Um, it's full bodied and full flavored. There's lots of complex flavors going on. There's um, and including minerals and limes and other citrus notes. The finish is slightly on the sweet side of dry. I'd say less smooth than some of the others, more of a zing and, and plenty of punch. In summary, I'd say quite distinct and complex flavours um, with sweeter notes than the others, but in a very pleasant way. I would say very drinkable and refreshing, very nice indeed. So just to summarise then, I've been really surprised at how much variation there is based on where these wines originate. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc is inherently a dry wine, but if you prefer a sweet or softer finish, then maybe opt for the sweet but zingy finish of the New Zealand wine, the smooth, soft and complex flavours of the French wine, or the more subtle mineral notes of the Australian wine. Alternatively, for a crisp, dry finish, then opt for the grassy freshness of the South African, the dry vegetal flavours of the Chilean wine, or the very dry melony punch of the Californian wine. So that covers how they all differ in taste, and now that we've tasted them all, as always, just for fun, we award our Taste Test Channel winners and Best in Class award. I have to say I'd be quite happy drinking any of these wines, none of them stand out as poor, and if you've seen some of our other taste tests, you will know that if I'm not keen on some of them, I'll say so. In the end, this really does come down to personal taste. But our top three winners this week are as follows. Winning third place, Porcupine Ridge from South Africa, smooth and refreshing with pleasant grassy vegetal elements. Winning second place, Cool Water Bay from New Zealand, full bodied with lots of zesty and mineral tones along with light sweeter notes, a really nice choice. But in first place this week in the affordable Sauvignon Blancs from around the world, the Taste Test Channel Best in Class Award goes to Calvé Terrain from France. Really drinkable, very smooth and refreshing, and lots of complex, subtle flavours. Well done to Calvé Turin. And as always, taste is subjective, and this is purely my point of view, but I hope this has provided some useful insights. So I've certainly enjoyed making this episode for more than six reasons, I hasten to add. I really hope you've enjoyed watching it. And if you have, please do consider sharing it with others. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell to ensure you don't miss out on any of our regular taste tests. Also, check out our other similar video on affordable red wines, where we compare six Merlots from around the world. And just a note, as always, to thank everyone who supports the channel. You really do make all the difference. We're not sponsored by the brands that we feature, and each video takes six to eight days to make. So a massive, massive extra thank you to the particularly generous viewers who support us via Patreon. You keep us going, and we are eternally grateful. As always, please do comment and let us know what food or drink items you'd like to see on some of our forthcoming taste test episodes. Meanwhile, thanks for watching and chin chin. Thank you.